So on to problem three we go. Um, um, we're talking in this problem about uh, this equation by a guy named Sherry Ann. He's one of the original membrane filtration people. He wrote quite a decent book actually called the uh, Ultrafiltration and Microfiltration Handbook. It's 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 okay. It's it's uh, it's one of, probably one of the earliest books on this whole topic. Um, but it, it doesn't, it's not very computationally rigorous, I suppose it's of its time. Um, and one of the things he did in, when he was looking at batch ultrafiltration is that he he dodged the mathematical complexity of the whole thing. And instead of you know dealing with integrals and trying to face them head on, he kind of skirted around them. And basically what he said was that the time for batch ultrafiltration is going to be equal to the amount of permeate you produce during the batch um, divided by the average flux, well, the average flow rate of permeate, I suppose. So if you think of it in terms of units, so we have meters cubed of permeate, and then you've got the flow rate, which will be meters cubed per second, um, and that you get units of time then. So it's just like, you know, um, how much water do you put in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take to fill a hole? It ta it, the, it's the volume divided by the average rate at which you can fill the hole, which are holes or whatever. Um, and when the flow rate is constant, that's no problem. But when it's variable as it is in ultrafiltration, then working out what that average is is not necessarily easy. It's like saying, you know, um, the journey to Cork is determined by the distance divided by your average speed, but actually working out your average speed is is very difficult. Um, and it's the same in ultrafiltration. But but Sherian um, decided well he would just use your bog standard arithmetic mean. So he said that okay, we we'll, let's work out the flux at the start of of the ultrafiltration um, process, and that'll be determined by your initial concentration. So that, that the K log C lim over C zero will be your initial concentration or your initial flux. And then at the end, when you reach your final desired calculation um, concentration, then you'll have a lower flux because CF would be higher. And he just said, take the average of the two of those. So it's the average of the initial flux and the final flux. And um, Maddeningly, as I said before, that seems to work quite well. He actually flip flopped a bit on this. Originally, he had, I think, it was one third of the initial flux plus two thirds of the final flux over two. Um, so it's purely empirical, chance in his arm a bit, but it actually turns out to be okay. And the reason it turns out to be okay is that the drop in volume at the rate at which the the, um, the volume declines is quite linear, as we saw in the graphs. It, it doesn't, it only bends really when you get to high concentrations, but, but that's just a mathematical technicality. So this is just, its famous equation, comes in various different guises, but this is the simplest way of looking at it. Okay, so again, I'm gonna go through a little bit of maneuvering of, of the symbols just to put the equation in a form that makes the computation aspect of this uh, quite easy. Now, if you look back in past exam papers, I've asked this type of problem many times where students have done it by calculator, so they do it in a more step-by-step -step way. But I'm going to do all the uh, the dirty work, so to speak, first, and then we'll have a nice, neat equation to plug into Excel. And when stuff is neat, as I said before, it, it makes you less prone to making errors. The first thing to note is that the amount of permeate you produce, VP, is equal to what you had in your retente tar, uh, tank at the start minus what you have at the end. I mean, where else could the fluid be? So what's lost by the retente tank ends up in the permeate. So the total volume of permeate produced is just your initial value uh, minus your final value of the volume. Now, using our notation that we've been using in this uh, section, log C lim over C lu is just B. Um, and instead of log C lim over C F, I'm going to do a little trick here. And we've met this type of trick before. So I'm going to break this up. I break this into two bits. So I'm going to have a log of C lim over C zero by C zero over C F. So the Z C zeros cancel and you're left with C lim over C F, which is what we have here. So we've done nothing illegal here. 
we've just written this in a certain way. And then we know that um, the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So this is log of C lim over C0 plus log of C0 over CF. So we've got a B plus a B plus log C0 over CF. So when you divide into two, then that the two B here becomes just one B and we need to factor in our half factor here to the log C0 over CF. And this is the key step here. If you look at this, that's not the same as that. So that's VF over V0 um, and that's C0 over CF. And why is that? Because of this. This is your statement of conservation of mass that you, at any given time, the concentration times the volume must be constant. So I can replace the C0 over CF with a VF over V0. And um, I'm using the, the F subscript notation here just because I want to make it absolutely clear what the start and what the finish is. I mean, pre in the previous two problems, we didn't really bother putting an F on that because I think it was obvious what we were doing. But in this case, because the average flux, you're explicitly using the final value. I, the F is just there to, to emphasize that. There's nothing new about it. So where was a word? So if I go back into word, no, oh, that's not word. So, so that's where the C zero over C F comes, uh, or turns into V F over V zero, which is like your V over V zero. It's like your S that we had when we were looking at problems one and two, and then finally a little bit of, of neatening up. And you can see once again, we have this factor V0 over Ka. So you can think of all of this stuff here, apart from the V0 over Ka, as kind of the approximation to the integral. Um, so remember I said that V0 over Ka is almost like a, a characteristic time. Okay, so, so that's the equation. And if you go over into Excel, um, I'm here. So what I've done here is V0 over Vf over V0, I mean, that, that's just your S, or the V, I was just calling it V over V0 in the last uh, two problems. But again, as I said, we're emphasizing that this is the final uh, value of V over V0 by putting the F on it. So I've just coded in um, that equation. So um, I'll just double check that. So 1 minus C2, so that's the 1 minus v0 vf over v0 then i've got the v0 over ka and then what i have on the bottom is b which is three plus a half log c2 c2 members vf over v0 okay so it's it's the key to this is knowing your balances so in a way it's it's harder to use because you have to think about the problem more whereas with just the blunt force of uh, well, from alpha, you just you don't really have to to think so much, um, which is both good and bad, I suppose. Um, so let's see how this compares with the values we got in problem one and two. Um, I'm going to go to okay, I paste it in here. So there are my my cherry Ann results, and we can see that. Um, so this is your exact, I'll just get my bearings here. I make that green. Can't be a bit of color. No, no, it's not text. It's this yoke. Okay, so this is our exact, and let's just see. This is cherry ant. So there's the three predictions for the batch time. Um, I'm going to delete these. So first of all, I'm going to look at the accuracy of the of the, my little approximation. So I'm going to go with uh, equals that minus that. I'm going to just square it. So 
I'll make it a percentage. Actually, uh, I. Uh, I'll just do an absolute all to the squared. So I'm just trying to work out here what the, some sort of average error is. So it's absolute. Um, so what that squared. So I'm taking the difference between my value and the exact value. Uh, dividing by that multiple by 100. So. Equals I hate that. Absolutely drives me mad. Average. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the average error as a percent uh, of, of a, let's call it my equation is 4.962. So I've just taken the difference between this and that, the absolute difference divided by the, the actual value multiplied by 100. So that's, that's a percentage. So that's the average percentage difference between uh, my prediction and the exact one. So let's see how Sherry Ann gets on. I think he's probably more accurate. Uh, yeah, I'll probably put an absolute on that. Just go minus. This is a, don't, the pluses don't cancel, so it's divided by that. So the Sherian equation is phenomenally accurate, really, which is really annoying, as I said, because it, um, it's just guesswork, I hate that, raging. Um, so you've got the exact value, obviously, from Wolfram Alpha. You've got the little log x equals x minus 1 approximation here, which is still very accurate. It's within 5% over for this particular numerical experiment and but the sherry Ann equation wins the trophy because it's it's a good bit it's probably twice as accurate if you look at just a mean um error um so really so as we've looked at, at three ways of doing this problem that you know if you have a computer and you've internet access um and this is not just about batch ultrafiltration this is about computation in general and using tools at your disposal that are typically at your disposal nowadays really there's no need in the main to be to be getting out of your calculator and trying to do back of the envelope calculations when you can crunch out the exact answer um, and it applies across the board in, in all sorts of areas of science and engineering that we have all this power so we should use it but um it's it's um it's still interesting. I love this stuff. I know you're probably going to say, geez, how does he stick all this? But I just think it's really interesting how sometimes something that like this, this approximation here, you know, you think, ah, oh, sure, that's ridiculous. It's never going to work, but it actually works very well when you crunch through. And then you have an equation that's just plucked out of the air um, and it works brilliantly. Uh, so if you like numbers and all that kind of stuff, then this this stuff is, is good fun. Um, so so that's it for batch filtration. I'm going to um, put some dye filtration notes up uh, probably tomorrow. 
Yeah, I'm going to cut down on the diet filtration stuff as I'm going to focus on one, the most industrial, industrially relevant type of diet filtration, which is a thing called constant volume diet filtration, which is looking at things from a different perspective instead of focusing on the solute that is being kept in the retentate tank, you're looking at the solute that gets through the membrane because you want it to get through the membrane kind of to flush it out. It's it's like the dia prefix is common to dia filtration and say dialysis. The idea is the same to, to remove impurities through a membrane. Okay, anyway, that's that. Chat soon.